Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode will explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This special episode was written and produced entirely by Robert Tensley. Though you may hear both new and familiar voices, Robert is credited with every facet of this production, from writing to casting, directing, and editing. I'd also like to say thanks to Lonesome Heights for today's intro music. Be sure to keep listening for more information about the people involved in today's production after the show. James Butler Hickok, more popularly known as Wild Bill, farmed, drove freight wagons, fought for the North in the Civil War, scouted for George Armstrong Custer, gambled, prospected for gold, though Charlie Utter would have argued that point, and served as a lawman in various places in Kansas during his short life. Wild Bill Hickok was the prince of the Pistoliers, widely regarded as the best and most ruthless gunman of his time. He was supremely confident, well-read, fast, and deadly accurate with his pistols. He always carried two that you could see, and was equally accurate with either hand. He was cool under pressure, and it was that characteristic that was paramount in his ability to survive gunfights and assassination attempts. During his time as a lawman, he developed a highly honed sense of paranoia, those assassination attempts that led to what some say was his last killing. He spent some time touring with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. He was a terrible actor and hated the experience. It was during this time that his glaucoma was diagnosed. At the time of his death, he was only a year or less from being totally blind. And he knew it. At the time the conversation between Bill and Charlie takes place, Wild Bill is world-weary. Only a few months previously he married, but then took off for Dakota Territory, ostensibly to make his fortune in the gold fields. More likely, he didn't want his wife to watch his decline, but that's just speculation on my part. He might have also been looking, either consciously or unconsciously, for a quick end to a bad situation. Charlie Utter was Bill's best friend at the time of the conversation. He had been a trapper, a guide, and prospector. Charlie and his brother ran a successful freight business. Charlie was a dandy, wearing white buckskins, sleeping on expensive blankets, and actually bathing every day. Ben Thompson fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War, and like many disaffected rebels, fought for Emperor Maximilian in Mexico. When he returned from that little ruckus, he became a gunman and gambler. In 1881, he made the transition to lawman as the city marshal of Austin, Texas. Phil Coe also fought for both the Confederacy and Emperor Maximilian. He transitioned into a saloon owner and gambler. John Wesley Hardin was only 23 at the time of this story. He had already made a name for himself as a gunman, and being just a little crazy. He was confident and bold. During the last year of his life, Wild Bill was world-weary. In the days before his murder, Colorado Charlie Utter, concerned about his drinking and gambling, tried to steer him into other lines of endeavor that would keep his interest and not lead him further into dissipation. Maybe one of those suggestions was that he become the unofficial peacekeeper in Wild and Woolly Deadwood. This is how that conversation might have gone. I'm worried about you, Bill. You can't just sit around a saloon and drink and play poker all day. Why not? It ain't healthy. You gotta be outside for longer than it takes to walk from one saloon to the next. You're pale as a ghost. If you don't want to prospect, do something else. I am. 
something other than drinking and gambling. For instance, you was a good lawman back in Kansas. Lord knows Deadwood needs somebody to keep the peace. You could do that. No. No, I couldn't. Why not? You're as fast as you ever were. It's not that. Then what in Sam Hill is it? It's a long story. You got some place to be? The last time I was a lawman was in 71. I was the city marshal of Abilene. I swear, Bill, one of these days you're going to push the city council too far. It's not my fault the council wants to act like idiots, Mike. I don't care if these hoopleheads carry a gun or not as long as they don't cause trouble. And shutting down the brothels is just plain stupid. All the same, I'd just as soon you not get fired. Councilman Burroughs would like nothing more than to see your hide stretched out on the side of a <laughs> barn. Because I tossed him over my shoulder and hauled him back into a council meeting kicking and screaming. By the mayor's orders, I might add. The man has no sense of humor. Marshal Hickok? Marshal Hickok! Uh, the mayor. He wants to see you right away, sir. Did he say what it was? Well, no, sir. He, he just said he was to come right away. All right. Here's a nickel for your trouble. Oh, gee, thanks, Marshal. Don't you spend that all on candy. Well, not today, anyway. No, sir, I won't. <laughs> and he won't eat any of it before he gets home, either. Want me to come with you? No, I want you to stay out here and keep an eye on things. I don't trust that passel of deputies they gave me. Especially that no-account Jim McDonald. Jim's okay. Not if he's doing like I suspect and spending his patrol time sleeping on a hay bale. If I ever catch him... Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Marshal. Thank you for coming so quickly. How are things in town? Pretty much normal. The Bar S heard from Texas just pulled in. The businesses on Texas Street are doing well. Good, good. Uh, we have a, <clears throat> a delicate situation that needs to be handled immediately. Uh, I don't know about delicate, but handling situations is why you hired me. Indeed. Well, do you know the Bull's Head Tavern? That's Ben Thompson's place, isn't it? Yes. He has a partner, Phil Cole. That's right. Both of them unreconstructed Southerners from Texas. What about them? Not them, their sign. Have you seen it? Not so as I've paid attention. They just this morning put up a new sign on their building. In addition to the name, there's a painting of a bull. What's wrong with that? It's obscene, that's what. The painting depicts the bull in... Mm, shall we say, uh, ready-to-breed condition? Ah. I've already received a delegation from the ladies' auxiliary complaining about it. And? Go tell Thompson and Cole that they have 24 hours to remove the offending member from the sign. And if they don't? If they don't, it becomes one of those situations we hired you to handle. What do you want, Marshal? Thompson? Co? Arkansas? I'll buy you a drink if you'd be willing to take it at the bar. That's right neighborly of you, Bill. I believe I'll take you up on that. What do you want, Marshal? We've had no trouble here. No, but you will have if you don't do something about your sign. What about our sign? And what makes it your business? The city council makes it my business. They've decreed that your sign is obscene and a threat to public order and decency. <laughs> oh, they have, have they? They have. And you have 24 hours to remove it or paint out the offensive portion. Now, just a... Sit down, Phil. 
What happens if we don't change our sign? Then I change it for you. And how are you going to do that? I'm as good with a gun as you are. Better. Why, I drew and shot a crow on the way. Did the crow have a pistol? Was the crow shooting back? Because I will be. You've got 24 hours. Take a chair, Arkansas. Did you enjoy your little trip to the bar and back? Why, yes I did, Phil. Thanks for asking. Arkansas. Somebody needs to kill that man. He's a damn Yankee who picks on rebels. Especially Texans to kill. If you want him dead so bad, Ben, why don't you kill him? I have to live here afterwards. Hickok's got a lot of friends here. What's the matter, Harden? Are you- Shut up, Phil. How about you, Phil? Why don't you kill him? After all, you can shoot a crow on the wing. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Business is good tonight. Everybody seems to be in a good mood. No fights. Yet. Things will quiet down soon enough, though. The cattle shipping season is just about done. Won't be long till I'll be looking for a new job. You really think they'll let you go when the herd stop coming? That's what usually happens at a cow town. They get rid of the most expensive man on the police payroll as soon as they figure they don't need him anymore. They'll get rid of most of the deputies, too. Well, I guess I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. You say, isn't that little Arkansas over there? Yep. Was hoping I'd run across him tonight. Hey, Arkansas! Like to have a word. Why would you go and do something like that? Evening, Bill. Mike. Say, you fellas like dodging cow ponies ridden by drunks? Walking down the middle of the street makes a bushwhacker's job just a little harder. I expect so. I'd also expect being so far from cover would make the bushwhacker second shot a little easier. I expect that the bushwhacker wouldn't get a second shot. <laughs> yeah, I guess he wouldn't. What'd you want to see me about, Bill? How long are you going to be in town, Arkansas? Oh, I don't know. A couple of days, I guess. I need to get back to Texas and tend to some family business. I'd appreciate it if you'd hand over your guns for the rest of your time while you're in town. We have an ordinance. <laughs> Well, you get right down to it, don't you? Best way. I see a lot of men still carrying guns. Hoopleheads. Those men use their guns to shoot snakes and jackrabbits. You use yours to shoot men. I'd hate for you and me to come to loggerheads. Yeah, me too. That'd be a sight to see, though. Thanks, Arkansas. Mike, take these down to the office and lock them up separately from the others. Okay, Bill. You can pick them up when you leave town, Arkansas. Come on into the Alamo with me. I'll buy you a drink. Ah, Bill, you do know how to sweeten a bitter pill. I didn't know then that little Arkansas was really John Wesley Harton. Wouldn't have made much difference if I did know. He hadn't committed any crimes in Abilene, and I didn't know about the warrants out on him in Texas. Wait a minute. Didn't he kill a man for snoring earlier that summer in Abilene? Mm, he killed a man, but it wasn't for snoring. The man had a dirk and was trying to rob him in his hotel room. <laughs> Harden once said, people tell a lot of lies about me. Yeah, I could say the same. Ben Thompson's pretty good with a gun. He didn't give you no trouble. Uh, he didn't have a chance. Later on the day of the meeting at the Bull's Head, he got thrown off his horse. He got busted up pretty bad. He was laid up until just before I left town. Phil Coe, on the other hand, he was on the prod. Are you sure you don't want to climb this ladder and do the painting yourself? I'll help you carry the ladder and hand you the paint can. You're going up the ladder. That's why I'm the marshal, and you're the deputy. Well, at least we'll have only one angry saloon owner to deal with this morning. And don't worry about it. Phil Coe's all gurgle and no guts. Hey, Bill. 
This paint don't quite match the background on this sign. You don't worry about it. Just paint far enough around it so it's not obvious what you're painting over. Get that ladder down from there. You were warned, Co. Now back up before you get paint splashed on you. This is private property. You got no right to do this. The city council says I do. If you want to dispute that, take it up with them. I'm taking it up with you, Hickok. You poured paint on me. This is a new suit. I'll kill you for that. Co! Back off, Hickok. You've been riding roughshod. Nice right cross, Bill. Can you handle that ladder by yourself, Mike? Sure. What are you going to do? I'm going to make sure Mr. Coe gets the message. Okay, Bill. Anything else? You might stop by the mayor's office and tell him that the deed is done. (coughs) Just stay right there. Get your boot off my chest. I think you need a little more time to recover, Co. Meanwhile, I'll give you a little advice. If you ever threaten one of my deputies again, I'll kill you where you stand. The rest of you, clear out. Nothing to see here. I didn't know it at the time, but that just pushed Co over the edge. A mouse would get his back up if you push him hard enough. If I had known how it would turn out, I might have done something differently. Nah, Bill. That's just the way you built. The outcome might have been different, a little, but you didn't have much choice. You had to buffalo Co. Yeah, I guess you're right, but I should have known. Bart, bring me a cold, wet rag. Ron, join us. Here's your rag, boss. How'd the girls do last night, Ron? Not bad, boss. I caught Joni's skimming her take, so I had to thump her some. And not where it'll show, I hope. She's one of our better attractions. No, sir. But she'll behave now. Oh, I think that marshal loosened a tooth. He had no call to do that, boss. No, sir. Sucker punching you like that. You could have took him elsewise. That's right. But he's going to get his. And he ain't going to just get knocked down. Let either. me get a piece of him, boss. I'll make sure he don't get up. Oh, you stay away from him. He's mine. He's awful big, boss. How you going to do it? You think his size scares me? He may be bigger than me, but he ain't smarter. You got a plan, boss? I do, Ron. I do. And it's a doozy. I'm going to put that marshal down like the mad dog he is. What about Ben? What's he going to think about this? Don't matter what Ben thinks. He's out of action for a long time. He don't have a say in this. If you say so, boss. What are we going to do? (laughs) We're going to arrange us a diversion is what we're going to do. Bart, you take some of the rowdiest cowboys and offer them five, no, no, two dollars worth of bar credit if they'll go outside and start a fight. Ron, you have the girls make the same offer. The more of them we get, the better. That'll sure bring the marshal on the run. (laughs) Yes, it will. And while he's dealing with all the rannies in the brawl, I'll set up to take care of him. That's real smart, boss. How you gonna do it? (laughs) You'll see, Bart. And it'll be a sight to see. I'll guarantee you that. Evening, Bill. Hello, Arkansas. Join me in a drink? Thanks. Believe I will. John, bring a bottle and another glass over to my table. Sure thing, Marshal. Seems like a pretty quiet night. Uh, it's early yet. Here you are, gents. I do believe that this is the first time I've seen you in here without a fistful of cards. The cards weren't running my way tonight. Got tired of paying for the privilege of sitting at that table. Lady Locke seems to have deserted me. At least temporarily. Well, I hope she doesn't stay away too long. 
Not that I don't appreciate well-wishers, but why would you say that? I'd have thought that you'd be looking to take advantage of my luckless situation and buck me at the tables. <laughs> well, that would be fun, but I'm talking about a different matter. Oh? Normally, I'd stay out of this kind of situation, but I respect you, so I'm going to make an exception. I know Phil Cove from back in Texas. He's not the kind of man to take what happened this morning lying down. Oh, I'm not worried about Cove. No, you're more than a match for him with either fists or pistols in a stand-up fight. Trouble is, Cove's not overly inclined to stand-up fights. I appreciate the warning. Come quick, Marshal. There's a brawl out in front of the bull's head. Must be 50 men. I knew it was too good to last. Time to earn my daily crust. Tom, go round up the others. Dirty! Get off me. Break it up! I said break it up! Get off me, The next Yahoo that throws a punch is gonna spend the night in jail with a sore head. Anybody wanna take me up on that offer? Who fired those shots? I did. Get out here where I can see you. Here I am. Marshal, you want to say something to me? Drop your gun, Co. Don't believe I will, Marshal. What were you shooting at? Dog. Might have been rabid, <laughs> for all I know. I'm telling you again, Co. Put down that gun. Why should I? You let all kinds of folks run around wearing guns. It don't seem fair that I have to give up my gun. Fair's got nothing to do with it. I'm the law, and I say you give up your gun. And if I don't, what are you going to do about it? I've got my gun out, and you don't. This is your last warning, Co. Put that gun away, or die where you stand. I'm not the one's going to die. <coughs> the marshal killed him. Those bullets didn't touch him. Bill! Bill! He just shot the deputy. Mike! He killed his own deputy. I didn't know. Not something I talk about. Usually. Usually. Don't know why I'm talking about it now. While I was down in the dirt beside Mike's body, the rest of my deputies finally arrived. We picked up Mike and carried him into the Alamo. We laid him out on a pool table. About then, I guess I just lost it. I raged around telling everyone to shed their gun belts or die with them on. Saloon couldn't have cleared out any faster if I'd set fire to the place. When dawn came, I was still standing beside Mike's body. By then, there were two empty whiskey bottles on the table with him. Not sure how I was still able to stand. It wasn't your fault. Well, it felt like it was. Still does. Then and there, I decided that I would never again put myself in a position that would make me so jumpy I'd kill a friend by accident. Get me another drink. I'd never pin on another badge. I'd like to thank a lot of people who were involved in the making of Wild Bill Hangs Up His Badge for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This was written and produced by Robert W. Tinsley. Robert took on all the tasks that uh, actually I normally do as executive producer of the Drift and Ramble podcast. So thanks, Robert. Thanks for all your effort. Thanks for rounding up the cast, uh, for directing them, for, of course, writing this uh, story in the way that you have. It's been uh, just an excellent production. Uh, all of the uh, sound effects, everything was provided by Robert. 
So thanks, Robert. Thank you very much for all of the work that you put into this episode. Wild Bill Hickok was played by Greg McAfee. Colorado Charlie Utter was played by Commodore James. John Wesley Harden was played by Pete Lutz. Mayor McCoy was played by Ben Stevens. Ben Thompson was played by Alex Gilmore. Phil Coe was played by Boyd Barrett. Mike Williams was played by Carl A. Nordman. The Young Boy and Saloon Girls were played by Lisa Rost Welling. Additional voices by Carl A. Nordman. Additional sound effects were from Zapsplat.com. And a special thanks to Lonesome Heights, who provided today's music. Without Lonesome Heights, we wouldn't have had the great music that we heard at the beginning of the show, and I would suggest that possibly excellent for other shows as well. If you're interested in getting some music um, for your podcast or special production, definitely look up and contact Lonesome Heights. Find them on Twitter, at Lonesome Heights. And be sure to uh, tell him that you heard about his music here on the Drift and Ramble podcast. Hi there, Paul here from the American West History and More podcast. And if you're someone like me who has a love for American Western history and likes to get to the nitty gritty of the stories, then this podcast is for you. We touch on topics ranging from ghost towns to lost treasures to explorers of the American West. For example, did you know that Meriwether Lewis of the famed Lewis and Clark expedition had very mysterious circumstances surrounding his death? Or that Mark Twain, one of America's most famous authors, actually took up residency in the small mining town of Aurora, Nevada, due to catching the silver fever? These are just a couple of topics we touch on and would love for you to join us on our next adventure. So tune in to the American West History and Lore podcast, available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher Radio, Google Play, and wherever else podcasts are found. Thanks again to everyone involved in the production of this Drift and Ramble episode. We really appreciate it. And again, kudos to Robert Tinsley for putting all of this together. If you're wondering about some of the products and tools that we use in the production of Drift and Ramble podcast, head on over to our YouTube channel and be sure to subscribe. Just look up Puzzle Audio on YouTube.com. We'll be making an announcement soon about offering some free sound effects to our subscribers, so now's a great time to jump on board and get involved in that. That's Puzzle Audio on YouTube. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment below. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzon. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast.